Good afternoon. This is uh, talk number three, somewhat delayed, be owing to the current situation with the coronavirus, COVID-19, of the uh, series American Women and the Right to Vote. Week three, this is about Helen Keller, a uh, Connecticut socialist. Uh, this aspect of this lady, uh, Helen Keller, is really is, is overlooked, in fact, marginalized, and in fact, in most cases, seemingly forgotten. Uh, and, and not understanding or being cognizant of her, of her political beliefs, affiliations, kind of robs a, a total view of, 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 of this remarkable individual, uh, you know, coming into this era, late 19th, early 20th century, uh, when there were a number of people who were socialists, they were progressives. This was the era of the union movement. This was also the era of communism. Uh, coming to the fore here, obviously leading to Lenin's revolution in 1917, to which uh, Helen Keller was a supporter. But to begin with, this, this lady was born in, Te in, in Tecumbia, uh, Alabama, Tuscumbia, Alabama, on June 27, 1880. Now, she was, the, she was the daughter of an Arthur Keller and a Kate Adams Keller. Uh, she was born with, uh, with the ability to see and to hear. Uh, it's not till she's 19 months that she loses the ability to hear, to hear and, to, and, and, and to see. Uh, however, her, interestingly enough, on, on her paternal side, her grandmother was a second cousin to General Robert E. Lee of the Confederacy. Her grandfather on her mother's side, uh, Charles Keller, uh, from Massachusetts, was a general in the Confederate Army. And her father, Arthur Keller, who was actually the editor of the Tuscumbian Alabama, uh, Alabama newspaper, was actually a colonel in the Confederate Army and at one point breveted as a, as, as a brigadier general. However, having said all that, she in 19 months uh, is is when she got sick, uh, and many th and she had many think it was scarlet fever or meningitis. Uh, when she at 19 months. Now, interestingly enough, here uh, the th this this brings to mind here the the uh, the domestic in their home, a woman by the name of Washington, and she had a daughter, and ironically, the daughter's name is Martha. She was a little older than Helen Keller. Now, even at this young age, 19 months going on 20 months, two years old, it's interesting how the human condition acclimates itself with the loss of hearing, with the loss of sight. The other, the other, uh, the other uh, receptacle seemed to come alive here. With Helen Keller, this is, this, this is really an amazing story with this, in this regard. She was able to, after a while, you know, since so she couldn't hear and couldn't see, how does she detect movement? Simple. After a while, she's able to develop with people walking in and out of her room. She's able to latch on to the vibrations of the footfalls in her room. And she could actually, and she could actually interesting, denote who is coming in and who is coming out. She could actually divine here whether that person was a man or a woman. And she could approximately tell the age of this person. Now, this is with constant repetition. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Gore Vidal comes to mind here. Uh, he used to, as a, as a young boy, he used to read to his, his blind grandfather, who, by the way, was the blind Senator Gore who represented Oklahoma in Congress. And he, this is how Gore Vidal really got into reading, writing, from this constant reading, and a lot of it, the classics. He, at one point, as a, as a young boy, was enamored with the idea of this new thing known as radar. And his grandfather told him, what's, there, what's all the excitement about? Blind people, or blind people have known about radar for years. Well, picture yourself in a room and close your eyes. Walk up to a wall. The sound of your footsteps bounces off the wall and your ears will pick it up. That's the foundation of radar. However, Helen Keller did not have the benefit of hearing even, even, even though she couldn't see. And so she would have to detect 
the vibrations made by footfalls. And later on, that is how she's going to understand music. She would put her fingertips on an instrument being played, let's say a piano, or one of the one of those earlier or one of those earlier um, record player type machines, and she would actually pick up the beats. That's how she got to understand music. However, having been afflicted with the lack of uh, sight and the, and the lack of hearing, her mother, when Helen Keller was six years old, was inspired by the book she read, Charles Dickens' American Notes. And in American Notes was the story about Laura Bridgman, a blind and deaf woman who was actually educated. And this inspired uh, Kate Kate Keller, to urge her husband to take young Helen to an eye, ear, and nose specialist. And so they journeyed to Baltimore to see a physician by the name of J. Julian Chisholm. Chisholm was an eye, ear, and nose specialist, and he examined Helen and then sent her on to someone else who was working with deaf and blind deaf people, and that was Alexander Graham Bell. Bell examined Helen Keller and sent her back to Massachusetts to the Perkins Institute for the Blind. And at this school, they had an audience with a Michael Anagnos, the school's director. And after his interview, he assigned a young woman who was 20 years old to oversee the Helen Keller case. And as some might have uh, guessed, that was Ann Sullivan. Helen Keller at this time is six going on seven. And Ann Sullivan will go with the Kellers back to their home in March 1887. Now, the first thing uh, Ann Sullivan did was to present young Helen with a gift. It was a doll. Now, Helen Keller's education process will begin with Ann Sullivan taking one of Helen Keller's hands and then using one of her own, her fingertips, spelling the word doll on the web of her hand, D-O-L-L. And after an, and after an initial period of, of having, having troubles here, trying to educate this young lady, the floodgates will eventually open up. How do you spell mug? How do you spell mud? How do you spell bird? So on and so forth. So now the education process is beginning. Starting in May, 1888, Helen Keller will begin to attend the Perkins Institute for the Blind. Now her, now her real education process begins. Six years later, 1894, Helen Keller and Ann Sullivan journey to New York City, where Helen will attend the Wright Humason School of the Deaf, and she will later learn, in, in, you know, as, as her education uh, uh, continues, from a Sarah Fuller at the Horace Mann School for the Deaf. And by the time 1896 rolls around, she's 16 years old, it's back to Massachusetts, and she's admitted to the Cambridge School for Young Ladies. And in 1900, she graduates this institution, and she's ready for college. Now, keep in mind, when she was 11, 12 years old, she's already published a children's book. This will be the start of, a, she'll, this will be followed by 11 other books. You know, as, as she becomes a writer here. Interesting, she becomes a writer. And, um, and now she's becoming a personality. Even at this, stage of her, at this stage of her life, by 20 years old, she's a well-known personality. And one of her friends here, one of her closest friends at this stage, is Mark Twain. Mark Twain introduces Helen Keller to a Henry Huddleston Rogers. Henry Huddleston, Huddleston Rogers is an oil magnate who is a who is a who is a uh, a official with Standard Oil. It is Hen Mr. Rogers and his wife Abby, uh, as as Helen Keller begins to attend Radcliffe College, they will foot the entire four-year tuition bill for her to attend Radcliffe College, and she will be the first deaf-blind person to graduate with a bachelor's, art, bachelor's of Liberal Arts degree. She begins to lecture. And interestingly enough here, you know, as she begins to lecture, one of the lectures that stands out is one that she did on January 22nd, 1916. It was in Menominee, Wisconsin, hard, hardly a metropolis. But this, this, 
In fact, this speech was brought out again on January 20, 2016, by one of the Wisconsin newspapers in the 100th anniversary of this talk. Interesting here, this talk was of optimism, of hope, good cheer, and According to the newspaper, this is what one of the this is what the compiler wrote. According to those who attended, Helen Keller spoke of the joy that life gave her. She was thankful for the faculties and abilities that she did possess and stated that the most productive pleasures that she had were curiosity and imagination. Keller also spoke of the joy of service and the happiness that came from doing things for others. Keller imparted that helping your fellow man were the only one's excuse for being in this world and in doing things of help to help others lay the secret of lasting happiness. Interesting here, these are the really the basis basics here of her moving towards socialism. Now, as an avid speaker, she will eventually she will eventually travel to 40 different countries and address people in 25 different countries, including her own country. As she begins to get a little older here, uh, you know, Ann Sullivan is still her constant companion. Ann Sullivan actually got married in 1905 to a John Macy. And interesting here, Mace, the Macy's moved to New York. And they actually set up shop in Forest Hills in Queens. And this house will be used as a base for Helen Keller on behalf of the American Foundation for the Blind. Now, she's in her 30s at this point, And in 1914, uh, 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 Ann Sullivan begins to take a turn uh, for the worst here with her health. Of course, you know, when they first meet up in 1886, they will forge a 49-year relationship. But by 1914, Ann Sullivan's health is beginning to go on the downside here. Uh, They will bring in another woman here to help. And that woman will be Polly Thompson, a young Scottish lady who, who who had no experience with the deaf or the blind, but will take up the slack and become a secretary. In fact, when Ann Sullivan dies in 1936, with Helen Keller holding her hand, it will be uh, Polly Thompson, who will, for the last 21 years of her life, will be that number one aide to Helen Keller. Polly Thompson will actually have a stroke in 1957, and that will sideline her. And over the next several years, she will actually have several other strokes, and she'll die in 1960. But after the first stroke, uh, another lady will join the join her, the entourage, Winnie Corbley. And Winnie Corbley will stay with Helen Keller until Helen Keller dies on June 1, 1968. Helen Keller is her 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 political her her her, her, her political history here is a, is a is a real fascination. She really begins to get involved with socialism in 1908. And interesting here with Helen Keller, why she becomes interested in socialism, and actually, in uh, it, she she was she actually joined the American Socialist Party. Now the American Socialist Party here. Uh, is is important from that perspective of how it got started. Actually, the the American Socialist Party was actually formed in 1901 with a merger of the Social Democratic Party. It was a merger between the Social Democratic Party of America and the Socialist Labor Party of America. However, in 1972, the Socialist Party of America became the Social Democrats of America, and that's, been, that's become more popular now with the advent of Bernie Sanders. This party was supposedly backed up by trade unionists, progressives, populist farmers, immigrants. Uh, they will field a candidate by the name of Eugene Debs, who Helen Keller will support every time he ran for public office. Uh, he will get over 900,000 votes in the elections of 1912 and 1920. Now keep in mind over a period of time, socialists will elect many people to lesser government positions. Hundreds of socialists have been mayors. 
and dozens have become state legislatures. In fact, they will elect two representatives to Congress, Mayor London and Victor L. Berger, but we've never had a socialist as a, as a president. However, when Helen Keller, as she develops as a socialist, becomes less enamored with the Socialist Party and decides to join the International Workers of the World, or the, as they were known back then, then the Wobblies. And the reason being is that the Wobblies were more proactive than the Socialist Democratic Party of America. They were more militant, militant unionists, militant socialists, anarchists. Uh, they, they were against the trade union movement. They saw the trade union movement as craft, as craft unionism, unionism based on individual trades as opposed to industrial unionism. They believed in industrial unionism where it didn't make any difference, your trade or your craft, you were in one large union. That's what they believed. All workers in a single union, no matter the trade or the craft, but they were more militant in their approach. Helen Keller was also a prolific writer as a socialist. And in, in, 19, in 1911, she will actually write something that's kind of the cornerstone of her po political beliefs. And this is what she wrote. The few own the many because they possess the means of livelihood of all. The country is governed for the richest, for the corporations, the bankers, the land speculators, and for exploiters of labor. The majority of mankind are working people. So long as their fair demands, the ownership and control of their livelihoods are set at naught, we can, neither, we can have neither men's rights nor women's rights. The majority of mankind is ground down by industrial oppression in order that the small remnant may live at ease. Uh, listening to that, one would think that she would be popular today with the young as they gravitate toward, toward uh, Bernie Sanders. But along her journey as a socialist, she will meet, she will meet and be friends with John Reed, Emma Goldman, obviously Eugene Debs, Langston Hughes, Upton Sinclair, Clarence Darrow, Anna Strunke, Big William, Big Bill Hayward, Robert La Follette, Ella Reeve Bloor, James Weldon, and, and many others of this group. Interestingly enough, she becomes ardently anti-capitalist and ardently pro-worker. She's very much the pacifist, very much anti-war, uh, was not really a fan of Woodrow Wilson. And she will support Lenin's revolution in 1917 and see this as the opportunity for the workers to establish a political state on their own. However, keep in mind here with Helen Keller at this time, when you, when you get into 1916, 17, 18, 19, 20, there will be the backlash from your government. It's the, the crackdown by the Woodrow Wilson government, and that will lead to the Red Scare. Many of Helen Keller's uh, friends and, and, and Confederates in the socialist movement will be rounded up. Many of them will be deported or jailed. Keep in mind what you're saying here, too. In, in relationship to the war, you know, the, the idea of the socialist, uh, this will also lead to an effort at, 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 at precluding here, at, at doing away with having many people come to the state, uh, come to this country. Immigration comes to mind here. In 1922 and 1924, legislation will be passed in this country, uh, the, the Johnson Act and subsidiary legislation. Uh, they, they didn't mind, you know, the, many, of the, many of the Protestants in Congress didn't mind uh, Norwegians, Swedes, Finns, Danes, Germans, French, British coming here. They did not want people from the Iberian Peninsula. They did not want Italians. They did not want people from Eastern Europe. God forbid they bring Catholicism and Marxism and socialism. They didn't want them here. And this is part and parcel, too, of a book written in 1916 uh, by, by a Madison Grant, The Passing of the Great Race, 
where he where he lauds, by the way, the Nordic strain in this country. Kind of a founding principle here of what you're going to see down the road here with the Nazis and the fascists later on. Helen Keller, too, was also a fan of eugenics. She was into family planning. She saw, as did, and she was also, uh, she also knew Margaret Sanger, by the way. Now, Margaret Sanger brings us to that end of this uh, plan, eventual Planned Parenthood. Uh, she was also into eugenics as well, but starting with the perspective of women's rights. Again, Helen Keller was a big fan of women's rights as well as women being able to vote. But Margaret Sanger here, just, just to digress for a moment, uh, was into eugenics and family planning. It was Margaret Sanger who thought that unless women, unless women have control of their own, have total control of their own bodies, they will never be the political equals of men. Never. She also thought that that being the case, that women as well as wives as well as husbands should have an equal voice on determining how many children they were going to have. In other words, family planning began at the grassroots with the family, with the husband and the wife. They should determine how many children they're going to have. And from that perspective, it gets to the point, if you can't feed them, you don't breed them. That's where they're going here. But at the same time, at the same time, Helen Keller was also part of this. In fact, in 1916, in 1915, pardon me, she will develop an organization with George Kessler, uh, the Helen Keller International. And this organization was devoted to research in vision, health, and nutrition for women. Besides the fact that in 1920, the American Civil Liberties Union, or, or otherwise known as the ACLU, she was actually one of the co-founders of that, too. And fascinating enough, with regards to that list of people I mentioned earlier, of, of many of the, the, her acquaintances and, and, and those, those friends, the friends that she made in the socialist movement, she also knew, by the way, or was acquainted with, every president from Grover Cleveland to Lyndon B. Johnson. That's quite a stretch. That's a long, that's a long, that's a long roster of presidents to know. However, when we get to 1921, 1922, she will begin to tail off her socialist activities. And the reason for that is not, is not a concern for herself, although keep in mind, J. Edgar Hoover had a 54-page file on her. I've read that file. It's an interesting read. But, she's, but she, knows, she knows really nothing's going to happen to her. Although at the same time, uh, she feels that because of her socialist activities, that many of her friends would be rounded up and then jailed and deported. So she backed off on the socialist message. And so that end of her political life really comes to an end, although she will never totally disregard socialism. She never will. However, as a global traveler, she was in that market to make these speeches and in the support of women. And during the night, and she went to different countries like China. Uh, she went to Japan. In Japan, she was she was she was very she was quite popular in Japan. In fact, in 1936, the Japanese government gave her an Akita, a dog you know, called an Akita. Uh, interesting how Helen Kellen gravitated to animals. You know, when she's starting to learn, you know, the the, the idea of touch was very important to her. She began to appreciate animals at, at, at the beginning by putting her hand on the nose of an animal and running her hand along the back down to the tail. That's how she got to know animals. Uh, when she began, at, prior to being a public speaker, interestingly enough, she began to understand voice communication by lightly touching another person's lips. And as the person talked to her, she can tell by the way the lips were contorting as that person is talking what was being said. So obviously here, touch was very much an important gift for Helen Keller. Uh, 
uh, that dog, the Akita, died in 1937, and the government and the Japanese government was actually was actually good enough to send her another dog. Uh, fascinating little tidbit there on Helen Keller and, and, and Japan. However, you know, as the Second World War comes along, and eventually in the 1950s, uh, she's getting a good deal older now, and she's going to begin to back off as far as uh, you know traveling, giving talks. And she, as a, as, as a resident of Connecticut, Eastern Connecticut, by the time 1960 rolls around, uh, she's really not going out anywhere. Although, keep in mind here, Winnie Corbally will be with her when she dies in 19, six, June 1, 1968. And, of course, all the accolades roll in here. Uh, for instance... Uh, Alabama, the Women's Hall of Fame, she was inducted into that in 1971. She was one of, later, she was one of the 12 inaugural inductees to the Alabama Writers Hall of Fame on June 8, 2015. Uh, every day, every year in Tuscumbia, Alabama, which her, which her, the birth, her birthplace is now a museum, they have Helen Keller Day. And Helen Keller Day on June 27 is actually is practiced in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, she will become the idol of many blind and deaf people throughout the world. But to get to know Helen Keller politically, unless you do, you really don't get the proper sense of this lady itself. She's an amazing individual. And in fact, as a side note here, uh, last year, the Texas Texas Board of Ed running the curriculum and trying to get a curriculum ready for the state uh, wanted to take her out of the curriculum as well as they wanted to take out uh, uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, and and the, uh, one of the reasons here is, of course, is that Helen Keller was a socialist. Uh, very much forgotten here in today's America. Too bad, too, because it really robs one of a better understanding of this lady. If anyone has any questions, they, they, are, they can forward them to me on this talk. Uh, my, my email address is alberts24 at AOL.com. A as in Alvin, L as in Larry, B as in Boy, R as in Robert, T as in Tom, S as in Sam, 24 at AOL.com, or mark at markwriter.com. Mark at M A R K W R I T E R dot com, and I will be glad to answer any questions that anyone might have or continue a dialogue on this remarkable individual. Hey, Otherwise, Mark. that is all. Yes. So I have the YouTube up right now, um, and I'm just moderating questions. Right now, we're going to, people are asking them. Oh, all right. I'm going to hold them until the end, okay? Sure, sure. Okay. In fact, we can go into QA right now if you want. Okay, um, let's see what we have. We have a couple people who are saying that we have a fabulous session. A session. Um, someone asked, how could someone who is, I think this is more of a comment, but how could someone who is blind and deaf interact with other people, let alone write books, graduate college, etc.? It's astounding. Um, let's see. And that's it is astounding, by the way. Sorry. It is astounding, but it's it's remark it's truly remarkable. But that, but then again, that is really a tribute to the human spirit. That's what that is. Okay, we just got one. How was Helen Keller able to learn so much about socialism? Who was her mentor? Actually, uh, Ann Sullivan and John Macy helped. Uh, Ann Sullivan and John Macy were pretty liberal in the idea of giving her a variety of literature. And she is going to gravitate to Henry George, who was a socialist, but she also read Karl, Marx's, Karl Marx and Engels' book on the Communist Manifesto. And being also uh, blind and deaf, when she got into woman's health, keep in mind, you didn't have an EPA or an OSHA back then at the turn of the century. And so really many business owners really didn't have much, really didn't have much regard for the health of their workers. And Helen Keller's situation was different, but Helen Keller realized that many women who became blind, 
or even worse, uh, was because of industrial disregard, the disregard of their employers, which is another reason why she gravitated to socialism, because she thought socialism would be that equalizer for society. Of course, maybe maybe you ought to give a brief on so, you know socialism. Socialism uh, is the common ownership of the means of production and the means of getting the products of production to market. And within a social in within a socialist society, you know, you you could have a viable transportation system, a viable public education system. Uh how about how about na- uh, n- national health care? Uh this type of thing. However, keep in mind one thing and and, and this is where some people get confused. Socialists were not uh, were not opponents of owning private property. You could still be a socialist and own private property. Marxism is different. Marxism, you know, Marxists do not believe, you know, so ardent socialists believe that you assimilate a nation or a society into socialism. You know, coercion is not an option. Marx died in the world Marxist. It's a different story. Marxism, you know, Marx believes uh, that there, there's only one way that the worker is going to get a better deal. And that's the violent overthrow of the established order. And in addition to private property, no, property will be communally owned because Marx understood in the middle of the 19th century here that in Europe, when they were, him and Engels wrote that book, The Communist Manifesto, that the, that the, that the factory owner, the bourgeoisie, uh, you know, putting the proletariat to work. The bourgeoisie op- owned the factory. The bourgeoisie also owned the land the factory was on. Do you honestly think they're going to pay the, the proletariat a living wage to buy property? The answer here was no. And so property had to be owned communally. But that goes along with the rest of a socialist society. Again, a viable public transportation system, viable trans- uh, viable transportation system to move goods from from production to market national health insurance this kind of thing now in other words everyone would benefit from the rudiments of society as opposed to capitalism which they were adverse to next question if you have one yep the next one we have um what did helen think was her biggest accomplishment and what frustrated her well you know curiosity curiosity was one of her biggest things she she was a very curious person in fact i'll i'll uh, i'll say that curiosity was really one of the reasons of success and the other one is education that went along with the curiosity you know she's going to write 12 books and you know, there, there's a side note to the writing of the 12 books, by the way, when Ann Sullivan was sick at one point, they actually had, they actually brought in a, uh, a journalist from the Boston Herald by the name of Fagan. And Helen Keller's in her mid thirties at this point, And actually the two fell in love. And interestingly enough, they were going to elope. Now that would have been a marriage made in heaven, so to speak. Her as a speaker, a writer with the help of a journalist, it didn't work out. Ann Sullivan and John Macy were not fans of this. Uh, members of her family were not fans of this. And the two, her and Fagan, will drift apart and she'll never get married. Uh, but she had a she had a unabashed curiosity and a long and a lifelong desire to learn. And as she's learning, I mean, the, 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 the brain of this lady sh- sh- should have been examined. I mean, this is a very intelligent individual. And, of course, she kind of went along with um, what her best friends, uh, one of her best friends once said, uh, Mark Twain, who once remarked, I never let, I never let education get in, the, get in the way, I never let school get in the way of my education. So education is really a lifelong process in or out of school. And that was Helen Keller. Next question, if you have one. That's all the questions we have for now. If there's anything you want to continue with. Yeah, add. I think about it. I think at this stage, I think that's about it. Next week, next week is about the 19th Amendment. 
the 19th Amendment was the 1920 Amendment, which this year marks the 100th anniversary of uh, giving women the right to vote. Now, I'm going to, when I do that talk, I'm going to go back into the mid-1860s and discuss the 14th Amendment, discuss the 15th Amendment, and how those amendments impacted the 19th. And interestingly enough, we'll go back, I'm also going to get into 1878, when the first legislation was brought up to Congress to give women the right to vote back in 1878. Obviously here, it didn't pass. But that whole story from 1865-66 up to 1920, it's a fascinating look into, into constitutional, uh, constitutional politics here, really, with, with really what you're seeing here, and the women's movement. 